So you heard the first scripture lesson, which talked about this vision that came to Peter, where God shows no partiality, but is no respecter of person, instead calls all to be one in Christ. We hear a similar vision about that theme from the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible. This is a reading from Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 to 17. Listen for God's word today. After this I looked, and there was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, robed in white with palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God, who is seated on the throne, and to the Lamb. And all the angels stood around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, singing, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. And then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these, robed in white, and where have they come from? And I said to him, Sir, you are the one that knows. And he said to me, These are the ones who have come out of the great ordeal. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. For this reason they are before the throne of God and worship God day and night within God's temple. And the one who is seated on the throne will shelter them. They will hunger no more. They will thirst no more. The sun shall not strike them nor scorching heat. For the Lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. And he will guide them to springs of the water of life. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Loving and gracious God, draw near to us once more. May the words of my mouth and meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. All right, I want us to begin with a mental exercise. So if you choose, I invite you to close your eyes and I want you to call to mind an image of Jesus Christ, any image, and then hold on to that image for a second or two. Now there are lots of images of Jesus you could have chosen. Now perhaps you chose an old churchy image of Jesus praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, or Jesus standing at the door ready to knock. Maybe you picked an image that's more artistic, like da Vinci's from the Last Supper, or maybe you, the image of Christ that's literally carved above our communion table in marble. My assumption is that all of the images that you imagined were of a Jesus who was probably bearded and handsome, and more likely more Caucasian looking than Middle Eastern, which is problematic on many levels and worth some reflection, but that's not my main point today. My point is this, when we picture Jesus, we generally picture him alone. We picture Jesus kneeling in prayer, Jesus looking up to heaven, perhaps even Jesus extending a gracious arm towards you. Or maybe we picture Jesus walking with one or two disciples, or at most at a table with his close, intimate circle of friends around him. What we don't usually picture is Jesus in a crowd, which is interesting given how often throughout Scripture Jesus is described as being surrounded by lots and lots of people. I opened up the Bible to Luke's Gospel, and I began flipping through the opening chapters after the birth narrative, and almost every chapter was a story of Jesus in the midst of a crowd. Luke 4, Jesus taught in a crowded synagogue, and it says reports of him spread through all the neighboring villages. Luke 5, it says people began looking for Jesus, and they were pressing in on him so much so that he had to climb into a boat and then preached to them while they stood huddled on the seashore. 
Luke 6 and following, descriptions of Jesus telling the parable of the sower to a great crowd. Jesus healing a woman with a flow of blood at a time when the people were pressing all around him and all touching him from every side. Or literally the story of Jesus feeding the crowd of 5,000 from a few loaves and fish. We picture a personal, private Jesus, but the Bible invariably shows us a public Jesus, somebody out in the world, somebody surrounded by crowds of people. And I think this distinction is worth exploring. So let's begin with the big picture. And by that I mean really big, as in outer space big. Back in 1985, Salman Al Saud was the first Saudi, American, Saudi uh, national to fly on the American space shuttle. When he came back to Earth, Saud described in a magazine what the experience was like, and he said this. He said, on the first day or two, we looked back to Earth and we pointed out our countries. By the third or fourth day, we would point out our continents. But by the fifth or sixth day, we were simply aware of one earth. What a gift it would be for all of us if we were able to travel to space and to look back at the earth, to see this bright blue marble set against the outer space darkness. Compared to the lifeless landscapes of the moon and Mars, which we've had the chance to explore, the earth is literally vibrant in the heavens with its expanses of water, with its mountain ranges, with its billowing clouds encircling the planet. Our world is not a dead asteroid, but in many ways it is like a living body in which no one part operates independently from the rest. And if we think about the earth as something that's alive, and knowing that our survival depends on keeping it alive, well, that changes our perspective dramatically. Second, let's come in a bit. Let's think about this, this whole theme, not from a scientific perspective, but from an economic perspective. As of a few years ago, every single day, over six and a half trillion dollars circulated throughout the world through the global foreign exchange system. We think of the world as this place where the land mass has been divided into nations and companies and corporations. But in reality, we exist in a place of global corporations, of banks and businesses that operate all over the planet and in many ways are fairly indifferent to national borders and law. And we live in a world where there is a rapidly growing number of billionaires some, as we've heard lately, are able to buy social media platforms. All of them are influencing politics and policies on everything from how we govern ourselves to how we fight disease. So the question is, as national boundaries dissolve, who is left to write the rules for the commercial market? Who is going to crack down on pollution of the seas and the skies we all share? Who is able to pass legislation that can corral billionaires, that can protect human rights, who can guarantee free and fair elections, and more importantly, the free and fair counting of those elections? The question is, who has real authority in today's interconnected world? Is it the Supreme Court? Is it the European Union? Is it the United Nations? Is it the Christian Church? Is it the Parliament of Religions? Not having a clear answer to that question is unsettling as we picture this fragile, interdependent world that we call home. Which actually brings us back now to the Bible passage and how it approaches this subject. One of the biggest moments in all of religion history happened when the Jewish faith moved from being a regional and ethnic religion into being a global spiritual religion. Now originally you were Jewish because you traced your lineage back to Abraham and Sarah. Now you could also convert to this faith 
through a process of being fully immersed, but mostly being Jewish was something that you were as opposed to something that you became. And so long ago, God established a covenant with the Jewish people, with the 12 tribes of Israel. It was a covenant that went all the way back to creation, but it continued through the tablets given to Moses, through the promises of protection given to the children of Jacob, and to the law that's been enshrined in the Jewish Torah. And this covenant of love continues today. It is the foundation upon which our faith has been established. But the radical move happened 2,000 years ago when this covenant was expanded to include all humanity. Revelation 7, the beginning of the chapter that I didn't read, opens with this image of a vast throng of people standing on the thresholds of heaven itself. 144,000 to be precise. Now they were being celebrated by the angels of God. And that number stood for 12,000 people gathered from each of the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, the number is more symbolic than literal. It's meant to show completion, fullness. But this vast crowd was also identified as those who are under God's protective hand, the one who has the covenant with the persecuted children of Abraham and Sarah. But then everything shifts dramatically in verse 7, where it says, After this I looked, and there was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, praising God. So suddenly in verse 7, we're back to crowd language, a world of global business, and multinational corporations, a planet best viewed from space that's home to all of us. And so when the angel of Revelation was asked, so who are these people in this great multitude? Notice in the answer what they are not. They are not from one nation. They are not from one region or language group. They are not descended from one set of mothers and fathers but they're described instead as people who have known life and known life with adversity. They're described as people who have known hunger and thirst literally and metaphorically. They are described as people who have endured hot and cold and climate change. They are described as those who have wept tears, who have longed for a shepherd who would guide them to a place of healing and peace. They are us. They are you and me and all people, children of God together. Do all of them know Christ? That's not stated explicitly in the passage. But what is said is that they are all known by Christ. And ultimately that matters far more. So how do we get our heads around this global perspective of God in Christ? How do we join this great multitude. Well, you know me, as a pianist, I tend to approach a lot of faith questions from the perspective of music. I've told you before how difficult Rachmaninoff's third piano concerto actually is. This concerto begins with an opening theme that is quite simple. A child could learn it because it literally only uses five notes. And so for the first two pages of the concerto, when the piano begins, the hands play in unison, but then quickly the notes that are played double, from eighth notes to sixteenth notes. The soloist goes from playing eight notes per measure to playing seventeen notes, and then twenty-eight notes every single measure. And by the time two minutes are over in this piece, the pianist has played over 1,500 notes. Now, this devilish concerto is 45 minutes long. What that means is to play it well, the pianist is going to have to learn, memorize, and perform well over 30,000 notes in thundering chords and complicated runs and arpeggios. 
So the question is, what are the odds that any one person can get 30,000 notes into their head, into their fingers, and actually play them in the right order? It seems statistically impossible, but pianists do it all the time, and the piece is performed every year. So here's the secret of being a concert pianist. You can train your hands to play the right notes, even 30,000 of them, but not if you try to tell your fingers how to hit each and every note. At some point, you have to forget the notes and just make music. Just produce the music you hear in your head which is now become ingrained into your hands. You have to forget the details and just trust and let the music come through you. The book of Revelation describes for us a great multitude of people before the throne of God. It is literally a global convergence of tribes and people and language, a mix of age and gender and race and creed and doctrine and faith traditions. So how do we make sense of something that's bigger and diverse than anything else we've ever seen? We don't. We aren't called to understand the details. We're called to trust the vision. And by doing that, we let the music of faith come through us and carry us forward. So maybe the next time we stop to ponder Christ Jesus and to picture him in our mind, we need to start by seeing him in a crowd. To see him in a distance, preaching from a boat anchored off the shore. To see him on a, on a hilltop where he tells the crowd to sit down that he might feed them from a few loaves and fish. To see him with arms outstretched, gazing back at people of all types who stand before them. And all of them, including Jesus, are looking expectantly at us. And then the question isn't so much, okay, who am I? What do I need? What do I believe? What are my religious credentials? Rather, the question now is, how can I step forward and join that crowd? A crowd in which there is someone hungry right next to me that I can no longer ignore. A crowd in which there's someone from Ukraine and China and Somalia whom I've never met but who now are literally my neighbor. Next to me is someone younger or older or just plain different from me. Because what if these differences are not stumbling blocks meant to divide us, but rather the cornerstone and the intent of the entire design? What if I'm not the melody of the concerto, but simply one of many notes that fill the score that are necessary for the overall beauty but not preeminent in any way. What if in letting go of the small picture and opening up to the big picture, a global picture of God in Christ, that I will finally see myself clearly at last? A beloved, redeemed, blessed face in the crowd. It's not being it's not bad being part of the multitude if that multitude is around Christ, isn't it? Amen.